Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us for this very meaningful evening. The um, Anukashvili's have had a very concrete and meaningful impact on our community. And uh, it's hard to believe that I've only been the rabbi here for three years. Within that span of time, uh, we lost both uh, Emma and Ruben. And the loss is still felt in our synagogue. I did not have the opportunity to know uh, Emma all too well. She was very sick by the time I arrived. I met her a few times, and I, I remember that her funeral was on Tisha B'Av. Uh, Ruben, I did have an opportunity to know a bit more because he was someone that was always here. No matter how wicked the weather was outside, it could have been snowing and sleeting and high wind or terrible, terrible heat, we could always count on Reuben for being another person for the minion. That, that's what he was like. No matter what it was outside, he was there. In this week's Torah portion that we'll read on Shabbat, God willing, it opens up with a verse that uh, speaks of how God gave us the commandment of Shemitah, letting the land lay fallow for a year at Sinai. And the commentaries question, why is this particular <coughs> commandment connected to Sinai? All of the commandments were given at Sinai. And Rashi, one of the uh, very significant biblical commentaries, explains that, well, just as Shemitah was given to God, was given from God to the Jewish people at Sinai, uh, so too every single commandment that we have is just as divine and also comes from Sinai. And I was thinking, as I was uh, anticipating today's, uh, this evening's program, that when you look at, when you looked at Reuben, when you interacted with Reuben, I think you really felt that he was someone who understood that we are the next chain in the link going back to Sinai. His level of commitment to every single detail of the law, his simplicity in simply wanting to do what God wants, really stemmed, was propelled from that deep understanding that we are a people that go back to Sinai we have a tradition that is rich, and we have to remain fully committed to that tradition. And with every day that, that passes, we really we feel the enormity of the loss. Uh, we are blessed in our synagogue to have a charity box that's taken around every day that has his name on it. So we feel that he's still with us in a way. But uh, the significance of Reuben and Emma and Anukashvili family on our synagogue has not waned, even though they are both unfortunately not here to share in, in the community. So I hope that brings a measure of comfort to, uh, to his, Ruben and em, Emma's children. They should know that their parents are still very much a part of the fabric of our synagogue. And uh, it's a great honor that you have chosen to gather on the, it's the full year it's a, it's a year to today. 19th of May, so, uh, but it's, a, it's an honor for our synagogue that you have chosen to commemorate the uh, Yeret site uh, here. We feel very close, we still feel very close to Reuben and Emma, and may their memory be a blessing for us all.
Good evening, everybody. It is a lovely spring day, and hopefully spending part of it here will be meaningful. <coughs> the purpose of today's meeting is <coughs> to honor the memory of my beloved parents, Emma and <coughs> Ruben and Ukashvili, 
and also to fulfill my stubborn ambition. Three years ago, in 2014, I made a book as a birthday gift for my parents. I wrote then, in order to figure out where to go, one has to first understand where he is coming from. And at that point, while I was making this book, another idea for my parents' next day birthday gift came to my mind, to make a presentation about my parents for their schoolmates in Young Israel of Fort Lee. They've been coming to this synagogue for the past 20 years since they emigrated to the United States, but never had a chance to speak about themselves. Because of language barrier and also because of their humble nature. It turned out no more birthdays <coughs> were left. Uh, although they were in excellent mind and health, within less than a year, I lost both my mother from incurable disease and my father from the tragic accident. Pain of loss created tremendous negative energy which needed to be transcended into something more meaningful and I decided to pursue the project and find more about where we're coming from. Here is a story about us, Georgian Jews. That's how we call ourselves. As per Wikipedia, Georgian-speaking Jewry is one of the oldest surviving Jewish communities in the world, having 2,600 years history in the region. Georgia is a truly beautiful land and the crossroads of everything, Western Asia and Eastern Europe. Bounded by Caucasus Mountains in the north, by Black Sea in the west, by Armenia and Turkey in the south. Georgia historically has always been under bigger power empire like Persia, Arab Caliphate, Ottoman or Russian <coughs> Empire, which ultimately affected Georgian Jews' history. There is a historical evidence that first Jews made their way to South Georgia after Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Jerusalem and Babylonian exile in 6th century BC. There is a tradition in Georgian Jews that they are descendants of 10 lost tribes which they support by the fact that there are no koanims among them. They also don't consider themselves as Ashkenazi or Sephardi, and also they call themselves pre-Talmud Jews. Jews came to Kartli, which is old name of Georgia, and requested a land from local ruler for tribute they settled on a granted territory just off Mtscheta, which is old capital of Kartli. For the period of time between first and second temple destruction, which is about six centuries, first Jewish Kamas had established strong and thriving community so that they were able to support new Kamas later on. It is believed that later, there was another significant influx of Jews after destruction of the second temple. It was interesting to find out that Rabbi Akiva, one of the most significant figures of Jewish religion, spiritual leader of Bar Kokhba rebellion, traveled in the Near East and the Caucasus on a preaching and teaching mission. He was in Georgia as well with certain objectives, because in Georgia he gathered gold and silver to assist the rebels in Judea. It means that Georgian Jews were known in Jerusalem as a powerful, wealthy community even at that time. Georgia by itself is an orthodox Christian country, accepted Christianity in 4th century AD being under Byzantium Empire then, partially, 
and partially still under Persian Empire influence. If you look at the map, you'll see that Georgian land is stretched from west to east, oftentimes being torn in between two big powers, like Byzantium and Persia, known as arch rivals historically. It is known also that Georgian Jews would move to the land under Persian influence, Persian authority, to um, while running from persecutions for forceful con conversion to, into Christianity by Byzantines, um, by Byzantine controlled lands. Interestingly, two Jews are sanctified by Georgian church. Their names are Abiatar and Sidonia, and they're considered a sister and a brother. Probably they were one of early proselytes as they helped Saint Nino Byzantine Christian missionary in baptizing Georgian king and queen. Traditional and religious tolerance never disappeared in Georgia, even after Christianity was declared as a state religion. Jews had their religious autonomy, along with many others being favorable for co-living and coexisting. In the Middle Ages, which is considered the period of time between 5th and 15th century, and the beginning coincides with the fail of Western Roman Empire and the end with merging into Renaissance and the Age of Discovery, 15th century. And this is the times of King David Armashenebeli, meaning the builder, and Queen Tamar, approximately 11th, 12th centuries AD. And those were the period of glory and economic rise of Georgia. In his book, Memory Symphony, Otar Sepiashvili, a well-known Georgian Jewish movie critic and essayist writes, when Jews were suffocating in clerical dark Europe in Georgia, Judeans were in advanced positions. They had wide international relationships, international trade relations with many countries, were well aware of the home and foreign policy of neighboring countries, and quite often established relations at a state level. It is worth mentioning that Georgian Jews historically were connected to Persian Jewry through Baghdad, which had another oldest Jewish diaspora and was considered a spiritual center of Eastern Jewry. From the 13th century, Georgia was weakened. There were endless raids of Seljuk Turks, when of then Golden Hordes and Mongols, and also it was a lot of internal conflicts, followed by strict serfdom. A majority of Georgian Jews were peasants at that time, and lo like local Georgians, they became serfs after they turned for support to feudal lords and ultimately became enslaved by their protectors. This is the time when ignorance, poverty, and fight for daily bread suppressed spirituality, religious feelings, and rose herd aspirations. It's, it was easier to survive if you were not a Jew. Although one premise of serfdom was preserved, the owner was obliged not to convert, not to force the conversion of his serfs to Christianity. However, church favored conversion by paying for the liberation conditionally, only for those who would convert. There are records how whole families were sold, bought, gifted, taken by Turks and Persians. That was the time of tremendous isolation, separation, knowledge deterioration, spiritual decline, which lasted for five centuries. It lasted until 1801, when a pivotal event, Georgian annexation by Russia, dramatically changed the fate of both Georgia and Georgian Jews. 
Russian annexation brought serfdom abolition. The second big thing, it was Jewish religious and spiritual rehabilitation, greatly facilitated by Ashkenazi Jews. And lastly, it was anti-Semitism. So first of all, serfdom was abolished, and free Georgian Jews started establishing synagogues, moving to towns and cities. Jewish communities would settle around synagogues, forming Jewish quarters later on. Each community would elect Gabai, who was responsible for community affairs, and Chacham, who would authorize religious life, combining the function of rabbi, chazan, shochet, moel, and cheder teacher. Ashkenazi Jews started settling in Georgia soon after annexation. Although the relationship between Georgian and Ashkenazi Jews were strained in the beginning, after election of Lithuanian Rabbi Wallace as a chief rabbi became a turning point. He was the one who established first Talmud Torah in Georgia, introduced education for girls, inviting female Hebrew teacher, accustomed Jews to different trades like shoemaking, leather tanning, soil, uh, soap boiling, um, bringing experienced teachers. He would send the best students to Vilna yeshivas. All sounds like Georgian Jews renaissance. However, Russian annexation brought anti-Semitism to Georgia, which was unheard of before it joined Russia. As Jewish community structure changed by urbanization, meaning Georgia, uh, uh, Jews were concentrated in the towns and uh, cities, the majority of Jews choose trade as their livelihood, and Jewish quarters turned Jews into the object of xenophobia, which could not be released against powerful oppressor, Russia. <coughs> Brutal pogroms and series of blood libels took place in different Georgian towns, drawing attention of civilized world. Jews were accused of the ritual killing of Christian child in anticipation of Passover. In 1876, there was a famous lawsuit named Kudaisi trial, where four Jewish peddlers were accused in murdering and bleeding six-year-old child. Not only those four, but the whole community was under threat of execution. Considerable funds were collected by the whole Jewish community to hire the best St. Petersburg attorney, which shows the community's great unity and uh, integrity. He was hired to defend the case. It took four years and three times child's body exhumation to prove the innocence. Although the accused were found innocent and not guilty after trial, the local population rem remained convinced that Jews used Christian blood for matzo preparation and blood libels continued for years and years. This was the time um, this, when Zionism ideas started spreading. It is remarkable that Zionist schools where Hebrew was taught as national language of Georgian Jews were established. Jewish theater, Jewish journal, um, Jewish schools, at the same time First Georgian Aliyah began. It is documented that by the early 1900s, there were 500 Georgian Jews living in Palestine, most of them in Jerusalem quarter near Damascus Gate. A historian, Zev Javezi, wrote the most interesting socio-psychological portrait of Georgian Jewish citizens of Jerusalem. He wrote, those people are tall, sturdy, brave, and strong. They come armed like Circassians. They don't know Torah, but great are the blessings they bring to Jerusalem. They have brought trade and spread it among our brothers, thus gradually turning Eretz Jerusalem into a trade country. The rich men have good features 
powerful, assist weak, given them cattle, share with them small shears until the weak improve their condition. Those were the people whose children joined Zev Jabotinsky, a Great Britain officer of Russian Jewish origin, when he found one of the first Jewish legions. Jabotinsky wrote later, Leviashvili, Moshiashvili, Enukashvili, Janashvili, and others, seven Georgian Jews, and all the long names ending in Shvili, which by the way means traditional Georgian last name suffix means son of. It was funny to hear how difficult it was for the English surgeons to call their names. There were seven brave men, tall, finely built, with straight features, and the first force in the entire battalion. I was fond of them very much for their calmness, modesty, and respect to their own selves, neighbors, and old people. 20th century brought another turmoil when Georgia became a part of Soviet Union. Soviet authorities cut Zionism after 1920s, cut it short. When Jews were dragged to factories, collective farms, and crafts cooperatives. By mixing nationalities and ruining community structure, Soviet country promoted atheism, secularism, while religion was considered the main ideological impe impediment to the country's bright future. Stalin's era, notorious for severe repressions, persecutions of public enemies, did not spare Georgia in spite of the fact that he was born in Georgia. In 1930s, by the way, both my parents were born in 1930s, nine Chachams, two of them Ashkenazi, were arrested and killed in prison without trial. The best known Georgian Jewish author, Herzl Bazov, novelist and playwright, perished in Far North prison. Remarkably, he was born just a few weeks after Theodor Herzl's death and named after him by his father, David Bazov, Zionist, first Hebrew home speaking in Georgia. Aliyah stopped for decades during Iron Curtain. However, this is a very significant and interesting fact that despite government efforts of massive religion liquidation, Georgia remained a distinguished place in Soviet Union where Jews observed traditions, still visited synagogues, carried kashrut, and I think that probably it was because centuries long Georgian and Jews' good connection and goodwill. World War II. Once State of Israel was formed after World War II, and soon after, it clarified its pro-Western Western orientation. And Soviet Jews became hostages be behind Iron Curtain. It is a fact that 20 million Russian died in war, but another 20 million perished from Stalin's despotism and totalitarianism. The second Holocaust was luckily stopped by Stalin's death in March 1953, interestingly on the day of Purim, when a miraculous survival of Jews in old Persia was celebrated. It was allowed to say the second Holocaust was stopped. And the next period of time, it's called, they called Ottibil, which means ice melting meaning the political looseness, which um, came after Stalin's death. It allows to say what happened, it allowed to say what happened to Jews during the war, and hope was back. After six day war, miraculous victory, in 1967, National self-consciousness rose in Georgian Jews once again after horrors of war and Stalinism. In 1969, 18 Georgian Jews wrote a petition to United Nations demanding the right to leave for Israel. 
It was an appeal to influence Soviet government to allow returning to their historic land. It was the first document of the Aliyah movement in Soviet Union, which first of all miraculously reached the United Nations and secondly received wide publicity in the West. I read that letter. It's truly impressive. Many knew how much people risked for this small hope. Unfortunately, their dream came true and hope was fulfilled. The mass aliyah from Georgia and later from Russia began. And by 1975, two thirds of Georgian Jews left. After several waves of aliyah later on, just a few hundred are left in Georgia by now. It's interesting that Russian aliyah was individual. Georgian aliyah was communal. Nowadays, most of Georgian Jews live outside Georgia. Most of them in Israel, in the United States, and pretty much all over the world. Georgian Jews, Persian Jews, Mountain Jews, Bukharian Jews, Russian Jews, these Jews, that Jews. After all, I don't think that some are superior or inferior. But for sure, each ethnic Jewish group is special, unique, and invaluable as a part of our national fate. A complex canvas of variety of ethnic cultural backgrounds we've been exposed mutually enriched Jewish nation, as well as those countries where we survived, persevered for centuries, and made our contribution. While searching for materials about Georgian Jews, I found out so much about Jewish history, names, traditions. I think it is crucial to look back, especially in our high-speed life, in order to be connected with your identity and roots. For this reason, I will keep so many beautiful stories about my parents, grandparents, Georgia, Georgian Jews, for anybody who is willing to know. Past is a history, future is a mystery, but today is a gift, and I can't express my gratitude, how happy I am to share this gift today with my family my friends, my people, to honor a memory of two extraordinary people. I am far from pretending to be a historian, and my pr <clears throat> presentation is not a fundamental research at all. It's not a research product, more it is a very comprehensive and general retrospective of timeline. I needed it to find out for myself, and I hope it was worth sharing. And now just a few flashbacks. Back in Georgia, each of us had two names, Georgian and Jewish. Back in Georgia, my grandfather would build the most beautiful sukkah I've ever seen from branches of bay trees, decorated with rugs, and I was personally responsible for hanging fruits from the ceiling back in Georgia. After engagement, it was a beautiful tradition when in-laws would send to each other generous gifts and most delicious food, especially a huge lekach, all pierced with silver coins. Back in Georgia, every Friday, an old woman would stop by backyard gate. We called her Israeli. Mom would give me money to give her and she would start telling me the most beautiful blessings. I think it was the version of Elia Anabi. Back in Georgia, every autumn, a truck full of grape would cop come to our house, and kosher winemaking would involve the whole family. I personally was responsible to watch the grape juice not to overflow the bucket. I've been in a variety of restaurants, including Michelin stars, 
most expensive ones, but I've never seen more beautiful laid tables than back in Georgia. I think it is gone forever, the tradition of wedding cooking, when a big family would cook for 500 guests. It was magnificent and ridiculous. <laughs> My father was a religious Jewish, but he was very Georgian too. He was too private to admit how he missed it all, but he took Georgia with him. Before leaving Kutaisi for good, he commissioned a local Georgian artist to create paintings <coughs> of Georgia. The beautiful gallery of Kutaisi quarters, where he was from, his dear house, which he built by himself, old Tbilisi, where he spent his university years, synagogue, where his ancestors prayed, all were with him in these paintings. I've seen my father and my grandfather praying, and it was a moment of truth. My grandfather was totally uneducated. My father was highly educated. They both prayed exactly the same way, self-forgetting and passionate. To me, they are the explanation of how a long centuries, Georgian Jews preserved the faith in the most pure, original, and unrefined way. And this is my story of Georgian Jews. Thank you. In Fort Lee, uh, I'd like to thank Nana for a beautiful, heartfelt presentation. Absolutely. As well as a professional musical video collage. Thank you, Nana. <laughs>